Well, good morning or good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this uh, Brandwood Biomedical live webinar. Um, my name is Arthur Brandwood. I am the founder and principal consultant at Brandwood Biomedical based here in Sydney, Australia. Um, before we begin, I'd just like to uh, say a few words about Brandwood Biomedical and what we do. Um, we are a regulatory firm based here in Sydney, um, headquartered in Sydney. We have offices in China, in New Zealand, um, and close uh, partnerships uh, in, an, in many markets around the world. Um, we specialize in medical devices and in vitro diagnostics, and we take a global perspective, driven very much by the fact that we're here in Australia, which is a relatively small, nonetheless lucrative market, um, but which has an industry which needs to seek to be international and to export from day one in order to be able to grow and survive. And that drives our view of the world as well. We are highly engaged both with the industry through support of industry associations and through the regulators, through either direct delivery of training to regulatory agencies or through support of organizations like the Asian Harmonization Working Party uh, in developing guidance documents. That um, helps us in two ways. It develops a, a credibility, I guess, but it also um, allows us to do a better job. We build relationships with regulators based upon trust and knowledge and allow us to represent our clients um, and work with the regulators more effectively. Um, we're also highly networked. You have to be well networked in this industry to survive. Um, and that means not only working with regulators and industry, but working with other partners and other experts in the field. And that's how um, we bring together um, uh, a rounded expertise to support clients to take devices all the way through the development process uh, into the market. And that's where today we bring one of our um, good friends from the United States, um, Jonathan Sakia, who's going to be talking to you about getting paid for your device. In other words, reimbursement reimbursement strategy, particularly in the United States and the United Kingdom. Jonathan is British, as I think you'll hear in a moment. He's a surgeon. He uh, came to the United States some time ago and uh, initially worked on development of laparoscopic techniques. He founded, um, co-founded ClinView, um, uh, quite an unusual and interesting uh, firm based on the east coast of the United States and now serves on their board of directors. ClinView is a team of physicians and innovators, researchers and designers which specialize in medical device innovation based on a primary clinical need. It's quite an interesting process that those folks use, and I'm sure Jonathan can tell you a bit about that. Um, but today, he's going to talk about reimbursement um, and uh, how you get paid for your device and uh, why that matters and why you need to think about it before the development process and not afterwards. So Jonathan, over to you, reimbursement strategy in the United States and the United Kingdom. Well, Arthur. Uh, for inviting me to participate in this webinar and greetings to all of you out and out there in uh, Webland. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I always feel very strange. Um, it's 10 o'clock at night here, so I'm sitting in the kitchen um, on my own and I'm not sure if I'm talking to myself. But assuming that I'm not, we've got a lot to get through. And I want to start off with one of my favorite guys, Albert Einstein, who said that Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Well, I've been involved in lots of different medical innovations, either as a surgeon, an inventor, or an entrepreneur, and obviously since uh, getting involved in starting ClinView. So I've seen this thing, uh, this uh, work from many different perspectives, um, and hopefully can share some of those with you, and hopefully help you avoid some of the um, the issues. We're going to start off with an appetizer and we're going to head into a rather heavy meal. There's a lot of material to cover here and I apologize if I have to go quite fast, but at least I'll be introduced in terms you can then do further work uh, to learn about it. So what are some of the things that I've learned? Well, profit is not something to add on at the end. It's something to plan for at the beginning. Uh, it needs to be on your lips right from the, the get-go. If reimbursement is part of, it, it, reimbursement needs to be part of your initial strategy, or alternatively not. And if not, well, I guess you're seeing the world like the Americans who said that um, the field of dreams, baseball, build it and they will come. Well, that might work for baseball, but I'm sorry, it doesn't work for medical devices. You want some examples? <laughs> I can give you them. A number of years ago, I was involved in a technology to fundamentally change the way 
we do phased colorectal surgery for obstructing cancer or perforated diverticulitis. The technology worked. Uh, it was clinically successful, but it was a commercial failure because it interfered with the way colorectal surgeons and, and general surgeons looked after their patients. There was a reimbursement, and the thing was a commercial failure. I don't know if you've seen uh, this movie, Fargo. If, if not, I heartily encourage you to uh, get online and download it. Um, it's a great movie. Fargo is also a place in the Dakotas, in the back of beyond, and it happens to be where you have to go in America to seek a national coverage decision from Medicare. And if you get it wrong in going to Medicare, it would rather be like Amazon. Amazon, when they got going, lost money on every book they sold. But they were going to make it up in the volume. Well, that didn't work for books, and it doesn't work for medical devices. You need to get the right strategy. So let's start uh, with my old country, uh, Britain. And every few years, they rejigger the National Health Service. So this is a map of the new simple NHS. It's not very simple, is it? It's immensely complex, and you have to know how to navigate your way around it if you want to bring a technology into Britain. Britain is, of course, a lovely country. It's utterly charming, and they love their old suit, just as they do in the United States. The first thing to note is there is no N in NHS. The National Health Service may be funded centrally, but uh, distribution of funds is anything but central. Some of the alphabet soups you need to know about if you want to get paid are the AHSNs, the Academic Health Science Networks, the CCGs, the Clinical Commissioning Groups. These are groups of primary care physicians who decide what services they want to buy and where they want to buy them from. The trusts, these are the entities that control the acute care hospitals where much of expensive care is delivered and, of course, where many medical devices are deployed. The MHRA, the Medical Medicines Healthcare Regulatory Agency, the equivalent, if you will, of the FDA in the United States. NICE, which I think is very nice, actually. NICE is the National Institutes of Clinical Excellence that help make decisions on what projects, uh, what products, devices, technologies should their way uh, into clinical practice. They are an example of an HTA, a Health Technology Assessment Group, and they are probably the leaders uh, of this uh, in the world. Uh, other countries are picking up on uh, uh, this modality. And if any of you have not been to ISPOR, which is the International Society of Pharmacoeconomic Outcomes Research, you need to register and you need to go. This is a growing field. And if you are not, if you don't have your finger uh, on the pulse of what's happening with health technology assessment, you're going to be very uh, badly surprised when you try to get reimbursed for your technology. Um, here's uh, um, a little uh, acronym that I love, YHEC. That stands for the York Health Economic Consortium. They are one of the leading health economic groups uh, in the world, based in uh, the north of England, in York. And their director, Dr. Matt Taylor, has become a friend. I've worked with them on multiple projects and getting a third party uh, evaluation of the health economic input of your uh, technology is critically, uh, critically important and is only going to become more so. VAC does not stand for vacuous or vacuum. It stands for Value Analysis Committee. These are groups that sit in judgment as to whether technology will find its way into a specific hospital, even if you've got a national coverage decision. And you can get access to my slides and uh, you can follow this link to something called A Simple Guide to Payment by Results. I suggest that you have a bottle of whiskey at your right hand and maybe even some ice cubes for those of you who like to put ice in your whiskey. Uh, this is Bruce Keogh, Sir Bruce Keogh, Professor Sir Bruce Keogh. Bruce and I train together. He's a marvelous chap. He's looking a little bit ragged around the edges these days because the poor chap has a massive, massive uh, responsibility. He's effectively the most powerful doctor in the world uh, in terms of uh, the responsibilities 
that he has. And Bruce said, without cost impact data, and I do not care how good the product is, if it does not save us money, it will not be used in the new NHS. So you can't have a more powerful statement than that from Brucey. In the United Kingdom, there are three main areas for reimbursement. Firstly, the drug tariff, not terribly germane to this group, but this is run by the Department of Health, or as we called it, the Department of Stealth, for consumable items that are suitable for prescribing in community settings. That will be your typical um, beta blockers and antibiotics that a GP would prescribe. The national tariff, which is managed by the National Health Services of England and Ireland, covers the majority of items used within the acute setting, and that will be the majority of things germane to this audience. And capital purchases are managed at the acute trust level. That would be things like your CAT scans, uh, your big coulter counters, any capital equipment. A new technology or a new approach to technology acquisition has been instituted, and that was the link that I gave you in a prior slide. It's called PBR, pay by results. Yes, it might make you want to scream. It's a payment system developed by the English commissioners and it pays providers for treatments depending on the complexity of that treatment. And there are two fundamental features of PBR. The first are currencies. These are units of healthcare that are paid for. And the second are tariffs. These are prices that are set and paid for each particular currency. Uh, this will become as clear as mud as we move on. Let's give you some examples. PBR covers the majority of acute patient care uh, situations, either in the emergency room, the operating theater, or the clinic. For instance, £119 for obstetric visit or roughly five and a half thousand pounds for a hip arthroplasty. Turns out that that is not too different from Medicare payments in the United States. PBR is expanding to mental health, the community and other areas. The currency for admitted patients and accident emergency or emergency room is the Healthcare Resource Group, HRG, which is very similar to the American DRG, Diagnostic Related Group. Diagnostic and therapeutic groupings uh, are linked together when they consume similar National Health Service resources. And to give you a perspective, Britain, like most of the world, now uses ICD-10, the International Classification Diseases 10th Iteration. And for interventions, they use the OPCS, the Office of Population and Census Surveys, uh, iteration number four, whereas in America, we use the CPT, Current Procedural Terminology. The idea between HRG groupings was to allow sensible and workable tariffs to be set. And under HRG4, there are roughly 1,500 of these tariffs. And each HRG covers a spell of care from omission to discharge. Now, that's important because that impacts your economics. The British have now, or the English certainly, have now worked out that it's important to look at the cost to treat, not the cost to acquire a piece of kit. And those of you who make pieces of kit that are quite expensive, I know have been throwing your hands up saying, but this thing actually saves money. Well, now within PBR, you can actually, with good health economics, prove that and hopefully get a good tariff. The currency for outpatient attendance is the attendance itself, which is divided into broad medical areas known as treatment function codes, TFCs. I told you that they love their alphabet soup. One very useful component is a national database that has been set up, um, which includes a great deal of demographic information. It's highly useful for those of us in the medtech space because you can utilize it for secondary purposes. So if you're bringing a product to market and you want to know what other people have done and what the addressable market is in the United Kingdom, you can actually query this database. It is available for your use. 
Well, let's look at your technology, whatever that may be, and payment by results. If it is used uh, on an inpatient population, then it's highly likely to be covered by payment by result. Fibrillator or a, um, a hip prosthesis, maybe, or a device used during a surgery. If it's used in the community or home, it'll be commissioned by the clinical commissioning groups. You'll remember that's the groups of general practitioners in a given geographic area be competing, uh, who will have people competing for block contracts to provide services to their patients. Alternatively, if it's something rare and rare as hence teeth, it may be managed by a direct procurement model, which might even be uh, at the national level. I know before I said there's no N in, in national health service, but for some highly, highly specialized services, there is. For those of you who want to do business in the United Kingdom, I heartily encourage you to join one of the trade associations for MedTech. The one that I'm personally a member of is the Industries. Um, uh, the, the folks there have become good friends over the years and I found them to be hugely helpful in navigating what is, I think, um, it will be clear to you, a very, very complex environment. So um, I, if I could actually hear your voices, I would be saying, okay, who can tell me who this is? Well, this, uh, this fine looking chappy is George Orwell, one of my favorite authors, and of course he wrote Animal Farm. And in Animal Farm, there's that classic line, all animals are born equal, except some animals are more equal than others. And that's germane to PBR. Because although the tariffs are derived from average costs of reported services with various adjustments based on complexity, for instance, final prices may not reflect published national averages because there are regional differences. There's an acceptance that in different parts of the country, disease manifests itself differently. For instance, in the southwest of Britain, the population is older. Older people have more comorbidities and are therefore more difficult to manage. Tariff-based uh, costs are three years in arrears, and uplifts reflect pay and price pressures including an efficiency requirement, and it's constantly being reevaluated uh, and changed. The best practice tariffs will ensure that tariffs are determined by the best clinical practice rather than average cost. You need to let that sink in for a second. That's, a, that's a, an acknowledgement, if you will, that the goal of a health service, and this is pretty shocking stuff here, the goal of a health service is to provide health care. It's not to save money. And the truth of the matter is that if you look after patients well and you do the right thing for patients, you actually will save money. The British have worked out, for instance, that tight glycemic control and careful management of patients with heart failure, yes, it leads to better clinical outcomes. It leads to fewer hospital visits. It leads to fewer emergency call-outs. Call it, used to, it leads to a lower utilization of resources and it leads to lower costs. So they encourage best practices and they reward them financially. The tariff that the provider receives is multiplied by a, a nationally determined market forces factor, MFF. That could stand for something else in the United States. but. It's a factor that is unique to each provider, reflecting that geography and other factors may impact costs, which I think is pretty fair. Uh, other tariff adjustments exist for length of stay, specialized services, or to support particular policy goals that the government or the local government may have. For those of you who uh, are starting out with your companies or are looking to expand your companies, I want to mention something. It's not, sp not specifically reimbursement, but it's going to impact your bottom line. And that's something called the Enterprise Investment Scheme. 
I've always loved, whenever I see one of these ATMs that say free cash machine, I always get very excited. Well, that's not what they meant. But the enterprise investment scheme, and here is a link to it, is a way to encourage investment in R&D based companies. And in fact, the last iteration gave one third of invested dollars, I'm sorry, invested pounds, uh, uh, tax-free and if the enterprise failed a further one-third was returned so it reduces the amount of uh, money at risk and encourages investment I think it's a brilliant idea um, and I wish they had it in the United States so check out the enterprise investment scheme another um, uh, uh, facility that was developed in the United States is called patent box it's recently undergone some change uh, as of last month, but basically, if you have uh, um, a company whose products are predicated on uh, something that's, that's protectable by intellectual property, preferably a patent, you can actually get your corporate tax rate grandfathered at a very, very low rate. Again, I think this is a clever way to encourage trade. Um, those of you who don't recognize, that is George Washington, who was into Brexit before it went mainstream. I was actually in England the, the day uh, that the vote uh, came in, and I have to admit to being quite horrified, um, but uh, it is what it is, and um, we shall see what it leads to. Some of you may, may know who this is. Many of you po probably will not know that this is a chap named Christian Eriksson, and Christian is a Danish uh, football player, proper football. He uses a ball, a round ball, and he uses his feet to kick it, not the football that we play in America. Christian plays for a club called Tottenham Hotspur, who I have supported, well, ever since I was six weeks old. No one quite knows what's going to happen with Brexit for people like him, who are in the United Kingdom as a member of the Economic Union, um, will he have to leave? Will he need a work permit? Well, to go back to health, health service, an 18,000 nurses uh, working within the NHS who are from um, the European Economic Union. What's going to happen to them? We actually don't know. It has not been decided. What's the impact going to be on function, efficiency, and finances? Will we have a recession? with the resultant reduction in purchasing, or with good management, will we have a resurgence of growth within Britain? I encourage all of you to think about this carefully. Britain is a country, as you know, of 65 million people. It's geographically small. There's a lot of money there, um, and there's a, uh, it's part of the DNA legacy in the country uh, to be involved in healthcare. So it's a good market, and it's meritorious of close attention. So, uh, why have I put up George and Ira Gershwin? Well, um, I, I sometimes get a bit obtuse when I'm putting these things together. Uh, one of the famous songs, of course, was uh, Let's Call the Whole Thing Off. You say tomato and I say, you say tomato and I say tomato. Uh, given how many nations who may be listening to this, I'm not entirely sure how well that will go down. I have seen people from the Antipodes come up to the United States and they've brought um, wonderful Australian uh, culture and habits with them. I, I was very privileged to spend time in Australia doing a sabbatical with the Royal Flying Doctor Service. I'm a very passionate pilot as well as a physician and this for me was a, a marvelous combination of, of two of my passions and of course I found that uh, the climate and the people to be delightful. The United States is rather like uh, Britain in that it, it's, it's two nations divided by a common language, right? Although we speak English here, it's not Australia, it's not England. You cannot fly up to the United States, spend a couple of weeks, exchange some business cards and expect to do business. It doesn't work like that. You need to have a formal presence here and you need to understand the nuances. I will tell you that it took me several years of working in America to realize that because someone gave me their business card, that didn't mean that 
they wanted to do business with me. Um, people are very free to hand out business cards, but you know you can't reach an assumption that it means anything. I mentioned ICD-10 before, and I don't know if any of you have looked at it, but with 26,000 codes, there's some pretty funny ones. V91.07, burn due to water skis being on fire. Uh, W5521, bitten by a cow. I don't know how you're going to get reimbursed for that, but let's look at the United States now and look at some of the nuances of reimbursement here. You need advice. It is complex. If, Brit if you think Britain is complex, the United States is many times more complex. The timing with which you do all the different steps that I'm going to reference is critical and it will depend on many things. It will depend on what sort of technology you have, where it's going to be deployed, and how it's going to be deployed. Um, for instance, we'll hear about coding in a second, and POS becomes important. POS can also stand for something else, but it, in this context, it, it stands for place of service. I was once with someone who told me with great excitement that, yay, we got a code, we got a reimbursement code. It was something called a T code. A T code basically means that Medicare deems that your product is investigational and they're gonna gather data for two years during which they and commercial insurers are not gonna reimburse you. You need to look at the cash pay market and I'd encourage you to check out two products as an example, Vital Stim, which is a stimulator uh, for dysphagia and the Warcade, a functional electronic stimulator, and look at the very different business models. And that's one of one of the takeaways. Whatever you're going to bring to market, look at other biz similar business models and see what people have done. You've got to understand the private insurance market here. You've got to understand the vertically integrated healthcare delivery models like the Kaiser Permanentes. And you've got to understand Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. I've never understood why it's CMS. It should really be CMMS. CMS is an agency within HHS, which is Health and Human Services, the American equivalent of the Department of Health. You have to understand Medicare and the gotchas, and there are plenty of them. I will tell you, astonishingly, that one of the most common reasons Medicare uh, has turned people down for national coverage is because when people submit their data, they neglected to include sufficient patients who were of the age for the Medicare demographic, the over 65s in other words. That seems like it's uh, unbelievable, but that's what happens. You know, in surgery, well they say in carpentry you should measure twice and cut once and in surgery, that's also true. It's especially true in things like circumcision, I suppose. But in business, it is definitely true. You have to get this right. For instance, when you're going to do a clinical trial, if you haven't thought about reimbursement on day one, you are not going to collect the data that you need to get paid. You may get have sufficient and appropriate data to get a regulatory approval, but you may not have gathered two or three additional data points that could have led to you getting paid. You've got to understand the landscape, uh, and it differs. It differs within different verticals that, that I've intimated, like CMS, private insurers, and such like. Um, it so matters geographically. Different parts of the country behave differently. You have to have the right team to help advise and support you. Organizations like Arthur's are extremely useful for helping position you uh, in the global marketplace. Let's have a wee look at what it means to be an American patient. Uh, and to quote that marvelous uh, uh, expression, lies, damn lies, and statistics. Well, here are some statistics for you. And I love this picture. It was a wonderful expression. Uh, I don't know what all this fuss is about getting in shape. Round is a shape. In America, the life expectancy is 78.4 78 years at time of birth, which puts America 50th in 221 nations and 27th out of the top 34 industrialized countries. America has the highest or near highest prevalence of obesity, motor vehicle accidents, infant mortality, 
cardiovascular disease, sexually transmitted disease, teen pregnancies, injuries, and homicides. Although U.S. males live nearly four fewer years than those in the top ranked countries, Americans aged 75 live longer than those who reach that age in other developed nations. And Americans spend a fortune on cancer screening and accessing MRI and CT scans, in fact, more so than any of the other um, economically advantaged countries. They spend 19% of gross domestic product on healthcare, and as you will see, not with great effect. Now, of course, there are a lot of social reasons for that. It's not just about healthcare delivery. Well, let's look at who pays for healthcare in America. The hospitals are divided 58% of them are prone, rated. 21% are government hospitals, that would be the Veterans Administration, the Army hospitals, and similar. The not for profit sector, which would be 21%. And what about payments? Well, Medicare covers 13% of the population, that's the over 65s. Medicaid covers 19%. Um, and roughly 50% of that are for inpatient costs. Medicaid covers uh, certain children, people who've got chronic disabilities, and the poor. Private employers pay for nearly half of American health care. And other public uh, payments, that's things like the Veterans Administration, cover 2% of the population. The private non-payer group uh, is roughly 6%. And prior to the Affordable Care Act, President Obama's initiative, roughly 10% were deemed to be unimpaired. That is a highly fungible fixture, um, uh, uh, feature. When I practiced in California, um, I looked after a number of people from the Hollywood community who could have afforded to buy the hospital, yet they didn't, for some reason, have health care insurance, and they would have been included. And of course, there's a lot of kids at universities and people in between jobs but there are, uh, there are a percentage of people who are uninsured, and of course there's also the question of illegal uh, aliens in America, which is a huge problem with the very porous borders uh, that they have. And these data, by the way, come from the Kaiser Family Foundation, which uh, was the same group that operated the, uh, the Kaiser health plans and hospitals. So CMS, I have mentioned, it is integral for coding, coverage, and payment for new products and services, even if they are not targeted at Medicare beneficiaries, i.e. the over 65s. HIPAA, which is the Healthcare Portability and Accountability Act, uh, introduced an administrative simplification. You should see it, it's about 5,000 pages. All payers have to use standardized codes for payment purposes, Health and Human Services, the Department of Health, is responsible for adopting the standards, and CMS has authority delegated to them to maintain the HICPICS code. We'll come on to them in a second. While the CPT code, that's the Current Procedural Terminology Code, that code set is maintained by the American Medical Association. In other words, the doctors who are going to deliver care. Medicare coverage determinations are generally used as benchmarks across the industry. So in other words, what Medicare does, the commercial insurers follow. And especially germane if Medicare declines to cover a particular item or service. So you see when my comment about doing things in a timely manner, if you go to Medicare and they say no, you've just basically led to a national no coverage decision. Additionally, the payment rates that are set by Medicare are typically used as benchmarks by the commercial insurers. Both CMS, that's Medicare and Medicaid, and the commercial payers have the same means of classifying uh, all the options available. Services and items are generally covered either under a patient's medical benefit, in which case the current procedural terminology and the HICPICS code are both used for payment, or a patient's durable medical equipment benefit. That would, for instance, be someone ooh, who has a colostomy and is using bags or um, uh, other uh, durable um, uh, medical equipment. 
I've put a link at the bottom here so you can read more about this, but my guess is you won't be doing that unless you have severe insomnia. Here are some important terms. Coverage. This is determination by a payer whether or not the item or service is covered. It's binary, yes or no, or it may be conditional. It's covered for patients meeting certain criteria. You'd see why you need to know that term. Coding is how a provider and payer describe an item or service, and I'm going to expand on all of these in a second. Payment is the amount that payers will reimburse the provider for an item or service, or in your case, an equipment manufacturer within a DRG. It's usually determined by a standard methodology applied to an entire benefit category, and there is, of course, a basis on the actual price of the item. If you do not understand what those three terms mean, you're going to have a problem addressing the market. For instance, providers must be able to bill for the device. They've got to have a means of coding for it with minimal administrative burden. And I can tell you, with impunity, as a surgeon, if you made it harder for me to do the surgery by using your technology, you've created another barrier to introduction. Be aware of payer reimbursement rates and methodologies when setting a price. And I, I, I mentioned before, look at what other people in your space have done and talk to your customers. To quote uh, the i -Corp. if you're not familiar with that, look it up, I-C-O-R-P-S. It's a course run by the National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health. Get out the building. Look at the lean methodology and learn about what your customer wants and what they're prepared to do uh, so that you can sell your product. Coverage impacts sales. Not all patients can make cash payments without assistance from commercial insurance or CMS. So if you don't get coverage, your market has shrunk dramatically. That 49% of Americans who are covered by their employer cannot afford to go and buy a $10,000 piece of kit. United States healthcare uh, payers are heavily concentrated, so basically these determinations are made by very few payers. In fact, roughly 80% of American private insurance uh, is, is covered by four companies, so a decision by one can have a massive impact. So let's expand and look at coverage. Medicare covers items and services to treat illness or injury within a Medicare benefit category. And here's an important term. Medicare has the flexibility to implement something called an NCD, a National Coverage Determination, prohibiting coverage entirely or restrict, restricting it to certain beneficiaries. That is what you want to be. So going for a National Coverage Determination, which is what a lot of companies do if they're not terribly uh, au fait with this, uh, uh, with this world can be disastrous. Medicare, although it's a national organization, actually uses regional contractors to administer the benefits. Without a national coverage determination, they can implement local coverage determinations which will impact coverage in that geographic region. And that's usually a much better way to go. Commercial health insurance, on the other hand, is state regulated. These are not federal entities. So, for instance, you'll hear about Blue Cross, but there's Blue Cross Pennsylvania, there's Blue Cross California, there's Blue Cross Illinois. These are state regulated entities and each has coverage requirements. Under President Obama's uh, legislation, uh, he mandated, or the legislation mandated, that there were 10 broad benefit categories, and now every company has to do something within that plan. Medicaid, I've mentioned previously, is, managed, is administered at the state level, but there's federal oversight because if you think about it, this is a matter of political expedience. You're talking about the nation's most fragile people, the poor, and those li uh, uh, living with uh, chronic disability. And here's uh, a couple of links for you uh, to read more about it. Coverage, well, I mentioned before, do the right research. 
clinical research to support technology's clinical utility and efficacy is great for mark regulatory and market, but you've got health economic and outcomes research. You've got to look at cost to treat saving algorithms compared to the standard of care or what the typical patient's doing now, or how you're going to avoid certain healthcare costs. Commercial health plans do not financially benefit from an individual returning to work. The number of times I see people saying, ah, oh, but we're going to get people back to work sooner. It doesn't matter. Medicare will tell you they do not consider cost when making coverage determinations. I'm not entirely sure that's true, but that's the, uh, that's the, the company line. Many commercial health plans already have existing policies that might be germane to your situation. So again, I encourage you, do the primary research or have someone do it for you. Work with people who can help you through this maze. At launch, plan to support patients and providers seeking reimbursement. Web tools, helplines, all that kind of stuff, but be very careful there are some regulatory tigers in the bush, and if you do things inappropriately, you might find, uh, as, a, as a friend of mine told me, he said, you know it's a bad day when people in uniforms turn up at your office. Uh, you want to be very, very careful of running afoul of the FDA. Coding. I met, I've mentioned HICPICS. That stands for Healthcare Common Procedure Coding System. It's a means of seeking reimbursement a little bit down the line once you've got some sales data. You should to continue to research the most appropriate billing and coding guidance to provide uh, to, to provide to providers, to, to the healthcare providers, regarding the use of a range of codes. In other words, your reimbursement strategy will change with time. You may initially use existing codes. You may then use a HICPICS code. You may then seek your own unique CPT code, having AMA, the American Medical Association, for a couple of years, and understand that the healthcare transaction in the American market may be entirely different from anywhere else in the world where you operate. You need to find and work with suitable specialty professional medical and allied medical societies. They will help you reach the patients, they will help you reach the providers. They will help you uh, if you need to file or want to file a new CPT code. They will provide the support that you need. Initially, see what adjustments to current therapies may be made to align with existing codes, but make sure you do not run afoul of any um, uh, regulation so that you're not encouraging providers to bill illegally. So payment, we, it's, it's you know the final chunk. If you've got DME devices, durable medical equipment devices, you've got to understand that because that will impact payment or you may be faced with rental fees and everything that that's involved with. And you've got to do the right trial for the right length of time. I've seen this before. People don't do the right length of trial to get reimbursement and their device is not suitably characterized. Research Medicare me methodologies for analogous devices and I've given you an example here, TENS, uh, tens units are all reimbursed the same regardless of the manufacturer and the cost. And I've mentioned Warcade, which I'd like you to have a look at. Ascertain how your technology is going to be viewed by the world. Is it going to be seen as expensive? Because that will impact things. And regardless of the overall strategy for commercialization, cons con consider preserving the opportunity to sell directly for cash. Um, whilst you're working out the insurance uh, mechanism. I've just got a couple more slides, and, and this one is all about stakeholders. Um, and stakeholders are extremely important here. Yes, you've got to have the right team, and I've already mentioned having relationships with suitable medical and allied professional societies. They will help you with coverage, coding, and marketing, and I cannot stress this uh, more, more, more strongly, that you have to get out the building, you have to meet customers. You may think, you know, it's like a classic story about the, I think it was the um, Ford Edsel, they brought it to market and it didn't sell. And people threw their arms up and said, but we did our market research, 
Well, they did. They asked people if they liked the headlights, did they like the seats, did they like the shape of the windshield. They never asked them, would you buy it? And of course, the answer was no. Consider presenting at meetings, but be very cautious of the regulatory issues. Working in the United States especially, you have to balance regulatory with commercial the whole time, and of course, all the while remaining true to your, your ethics and your corporate values. Consider building strong relationships with these societies, because they can also help you with training where appropriate, and that will be viewed very well both by uh, the Food and Drug Administration and the, uh, the entities that pay for therapy. And I, you know, everyone wants to get into business to make money, and I started at the beginning by saying that, yes, you've got to make a profit. Off-label promotion in the United States, well, I like to tell people I don't look good in orange and my business partner is way too pretty to go to prison. Off-label promotion is illegal and you must not do it. So in summary, reimbursement has to be on your lips from day one. It will, or it certainly should, influence every decision you make, including how you build your technology, okay? Uh, how you run your clinical trials and who you team with. It's an extremely complex mechanism on both sides of the pond, and clinical practice is different on both sides of the pond. When I moved to the United States, having trained in Britain, I was doing a lot of endoscopy in Britain. And when I went to California and said, I, you know, I intended to do uh, upper GI endoscopy and colonoscopy, my surgical colleagues looked at me like I was mad. And they said, uh, you'll never get a referral from the gastroenterologist. They'll view you as a threat. It's, um, you know, this is all about territory. You've got to understand that territory and you've got to understand behaviors. Build the right team, and having done it the wrong way many times, that was my definition of insanity, getting the right people on board to support you both full-time and as consultants is key. Others have done it, so can you. Um, I put my email address up there and um, uh, a help email address uh, to reach Arthur. Um, and I want to, at this point, thank Arthur very much and the whole team at Brandwood, Sean, for her help with uh, my technical incompetence. Um, I hope those of you out there in webinar land uh, have found this to be somewhat helpful. Um, and uh, I believe we have some time left uh, for a few questions. Um, so uh, assuming that I haven't dropped off and I've been talking to myself for the last 40 minutes or so, I'm going to hand it back to Arthur. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Um, I think we've now switched the screens. Uh, thank you for uh, a bewildering presentation, but fascinating. B bewildering uh, range of alphabet soup, but I think you've done a very nice job at trying to pull it all together. Um, we have a bunch of questions and about five or ten minutes left to take questions. So um, I'd like to start off, uh, Jonathan, with a question from um, from Vivian, who says, you mentioned health economics. How do you get that done? Can you uh, in, enlarge on that a little bit? Sure. Can you can you hear me? Okay. I can. Excellent. Jolly good. Okay. So um, I like. There's a few groups that I like to work with. Um, uh, I've done most of my work with uh, the York Health Economic Consortium. This is a corporation that's spun out of York University and is staffed by health economists. What you do, um, I encourage people to go and talk to a health economist at the, er at the earliest stage possible. Literally, you're starting your company, you haven't built anything yet, go and talk to them because they, the information that they help you structure will help you ascertain how you can build your device, how you can best build it, and how you can position it for sale. Basically, what's involved is uh, sitting down with, with a group, ascertaining that they have a, a comprehension of the area in which you're going to work, so they've got to have some expertise, let's say it's wound therapeutics or it's interventional cardiology or orthopedics, whatever it might be. They will then ask you about your device and your technology. They will ask you for what data you have on your technology, but you actually don't even need to have data. They, you will have presumptions. 
and they will create a business model and they will populate it with what is known in the literature and then that business model becomes highly adaptive as your data develops and you can see that well if in fact we speed up wound healing by 20 percent the impact it has on the cost to deliver care in the United Kingdom, the United States, in a, in a, a Medicare patient, in someone with the VA system, or someone in the British system. So it, it's an iterative process and it, it's a collaborative process. You have to give them information, but if you work with the right group, they're very sophisticated at doing it. Thank you. Oh, um, by the way, yeah. one other thing, just one other thing I wanted to say, that if you work with the right economics group, um, that is the, the sort of group that NICE would normally um, commission to come in and do some work for, for them, you may actually uh, accelerate your acceptance and get a nice guidance, which is something I didn't really uh, speak about much. So, so the, the, the health economics group can do some work for NICE, where, which leads to a guidance that can then uh, support your reimbursement, is what you're saying? Correct, because sometimes NICE will decide that they're going to go and address an area, right, and they will commission an economics report. Well, if you, you see, what I would normally do on day one, I would go and meet with the regulators, I would go and meet with FDA, day one, I would go and meet with um, no, the notified body folks, I would go and meet with NICE, and I would go and meet with the, the um the health economist, I would say, this is what I'm planning on building, what do you think? And actually, I have found them to be highly receptive, and the folks at NICE have said, this is an, unmet, an area of unmet clinical need, if you can show this kind of benefit, this is what we recommend you do, they'll even look at your trial for you and say, I would tweak this, that, or the other. Mm -hmm. can, can we just look at, at that? idea of starting at the at the end. Um, I remember once, Jonathan, you said to me that um, you could actually take the approach of using the, re the description of the reimbursement code as a design input. So you go and look at a code and decide to build something that meets the existing code rather than having to go through the grief of getting an, a new one. And I have a question here from, from Daxel who says, as a startup with limited resources in the ophthalmic space, I think he works for an ophthalmic company, and the currently there are currently established CPT codes, what should you do? What should you be wary of? And, and do you want to comment on that? You know, starting at the end and using the, the coding as the as the input to the device design. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a great question. Um, you know, let's face it. If you want to go through the process of bringing something to market for which there is no um, readily available. Um, methodology to get it paid for, you are going to be pushing rocks uphill. Uh, so going into something where there is a, a CPT code that carries good reimbursement and that physicians are using, so it's a question of, yes, there may be a code, but how often is it being used, right? Um, and, you know, let's see, you know, ascertain what physicians are using it for, what methodologies are they currently using, what devices are they currently using within that CPT. And if it makes sense and you can actually bring something to market that will do the same as or even better than what's currently there and will fit into that CPT code, dynamite. Fabulous. You've just saved yourself a lot of work. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you. You talked a lot about the, the public-private split in the US. What about private medicine in the United Kingdom? Tracy asked that specific question. What about private medicine? In, in the UK itself? Yeah, very good question. Um, so uh, it's it's not as prevalent uh, as in, you know, there's, there's the perception that, as in the United States. You know, it's a good number of people. It's largely a London phenomenon. Uh, there is now no private insurance in, in Scotland. That all died a death a number of years ago. There are private hospitals in Northern Ireland. Um, but it's largely concentrated in London and the South. The, um, there are very few private insurance. The biggest ones are Bupa and uh, PPP, um, which has now been renamed. And then there are very few groups of hospitals, which is great.
because if you go to, for instance, Spire, S-P-I-R-E, the Spire hospitals, I think they've got about 30 hospitals, and then there's the HCA, which is, the, of course, the American chain, Columbia HCA. Um, they, uh, they have facilities. There's no outpatient private insurance. It's all pretty much acute care or operative care. But, you know, they're very um, they're easy to go and see. Um, uh, and there's also a pretty big cash pay market in the United Kingdom largely catering to the trade from the Middle East. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a big uh, trade from the Middle East. Some of the hospitals in London um, are almost exclusively um, operated by patients from the Middle East. So yes, it's, it's, a, it's a good market and it's a, a worthy market and you get very well paid. Thank you. Um, let me just see, we've got a, a bunch of other questions here. I'll just pick a couple of them out. Um, Okay, building relationships. Jamie asked the question, um, I have been contacted by a respiratory doctor in New York about a device that they are looking to build and uh, what advice do you have for a small startup in Australia, in Melbourne, building relationships for the first time in the United States? Are you is the suggestion that there's a physician who's invented a device? No, I think I think the device comes from Australia, but there's a physician interested in using the device in the United States, and so you know, starting to build the relationships with the clinical community and others, and and, and that's right, that's what Jimmy says. That's correct. Okay, right. Well, um, I I intimated uh, that one has to be very cautious about flying up and flying back down. Look, the terminology key opinion leader is banded about an awful lot. Arthur, you and I have talked about this. Um, I, I, the guy may be an amazing physician and an amazing ally, but you want to choose the people you're going to work with very, very carefully. You want to check their bona fides. You want to make sure that they're very well, um, that they're very good at their job, uh, that they haven't had issues that they're not working with another company and that they're just, um, you know, I'm not suggesting this person but in particular, but just in general, be very, very, don't do this at, at long distance. And quite frankly also, ascertain how this person is viewed by the other members of the profession. If it's someone who's universally loved, I mean, you know, I did a lot of work in colorectal surgery and there was a chap named Vic Fazio. Uh, who worked in Cleveland, and he was actually from, from Australia. Um, and quite frankly, if, if I heard that Vic had developed anything, I would immediately be interested because, you know, I thought Vic wore water. So choose the people you collaborate with very, very carefully. Just because they've got a big name and they come from a big hospital, don't jump. Be cautious. Well, thank you, Jonathan. We, we, uh, we've reached our hour. Um, we do have a, two or three more questions. Um, what we always do is um, we will uh, collect all of those questions, and uh, Jonathan, I'll, I'll forward them to you uh, afterwards, and we can uh, send off a, a note by email to everybody who's attended, just covering off the questions um, that have been asked, so that you'll all, uh, they will all be uh, receive an answer. Thank you indeed for a, a fascinating presentation, um, quite a different one to our normal uh, series of webinars. Um, uh, I think the, the key takeaway I have is that um, this is a complicated area, very complicated, and uh, really you need to develop a bespoke solution for your particular device and your particular technology and your market entry. So understanding at the beginning and doing the primary research is, is, the, is, the, is the point, and for that you need expertise. You've just got to go and find people who understand it, and Jonathan, I know you do better than most people that I've ever come across in this space. Um, so uh, if you're looking at this, I think that's the, that's the takeaway I have. Find the right experts and figure out what the solution is for you, and for goodness sake, do it before you spend too much money on the product development. Uh, I think that's uh, you would agree with me there, Jonathan. Thank you again, um, and, and thank you for our audience. We've had a large uh, number of people attending this webinar, and uh, I think we've all learned something. Good afternoon, everybody, or good evening. <laughs>